Cherry Hill, New Jersey, suburban Philadelphia's promised land. A place where the roads are wide, the malls huge, and the churches and synagogues are of downright biblical proportions. Good thing, too, because in the fall of 1994, Cherry Hill had one humdinger of a sin on its hands. Big enough to wreck a congregation, at least three lives, and a whole slew of commandments. To think about it was like a, um, like a movie. It's a very unique community. The last place you'd expect a birth. Miles from the bustling streets of Philadelphia, Cherry Hill's a picture-perfect suburb. Peaceful, prosperous, and safe. Or it was, until a mysterious intruder. This guy knew that he was at the rabbi's house. And an unthinkable crime. It was a perfectly uh, set living room with, unfortunately, a, uh, a murder victim laying on the floor. Left Cherry Hill doubting its safety and one of its leading citizens. There's no way he's involved in this. A man of God doesn't do things like this. When the truth finally came out, it'd be even more shocking than the crime itself. If you were in the CIA, would you tell anybody? The person he wanted harmed was an enemy of Israel. And that was only the beginning. Just across the Delaware River from Philadelphia, Cherry Hill is a miracle of modern suburbia. Jumping in 40 years from a farming hamlet in the sticks to a place where traffic snakes through mile after mile of shopping centers and subdivisions. The town's a living testament to the holy trinity of modern real estate development. Location, location, location. Cherry Hill has all of that. It's just outside Philadelphia. It's located near major interstates. And it's got all the qualities of a residential neighborhood and all the benefits of a small city. And all the traffic of a full-fledged metropolis. Uh, snap your finger at any given time during the day uh, because of the traffic, the malls, the major highways, you would have over a quarter of a million people in this town. Most days, the traffic on Route 70, Cherry Hill's main drag, is as thick as a swarm of locusts. Tough traffic. Got to get in a car, you want to buy a newspaper, a Pepsi-Cola, and it's just always a bottleneck. Oh, and speaking of shopping, Route 70 is a franchise free-for-all, littered with roadside shrines to the gods of commerce. Route 70 is just solid hotels, car dealerships, restaurants, diners, franchises, donut shops, gas stations. I mean, they're just one after the other for miles and miles right on into Philadelphia. But it is one place that outshines even the big box bounty and casual dining decadence of Route 70. It's the Cherry Hill Mall, one of the oldest and largest malls on the entire East Coast is as close as Cherry Hill comes to having a downtown. Cherry Hill has many neighborhoods. Uh, if you wanted to look at the center, I would probably direct you to the mall. Uh, it's that kind of town. Cherry Hill has no shortage of subdivisions. Mile upon mile, split levels, split foyers, and colonials. We have a number of developments that are older. Uh, built in the 60s and 70s, uh, and they have a certain style to them. And then other areas that may be a little more affluent have, uh, you know, the larger homes and larger lots. Uh, it's, a, it's a mix, but it's generally a, a homogenous mix of um, middle class and upper middle class people who um, settled there and stayed there because of the schools and the proximity to the city. Middle class as it is, Cherry Hill's subdivisions are hardly a wasp wonderland of white bread and white collars. We have a, uh, a tremendous diverse community here, a large uh, Asian population and Jewish population and Indian po population. It's kind of a, uh, a melting pot here in Cherry Hill. Although considering that nearly a third of Cherry Hill's 70,000 residents are Jewish, odds are pretty good that it's matzo ball soup simmering in Cherry Hill's pot. There's a very uh, broad Jewish community in Cherry Hill. Uh, different congregations uh, within the Jewish community. You have Reformed temples, uh, conservative temples, and Orthodox temples. 
not to mention businesses that cater to the Jewish community. Everything from kosher delis to clothing stores like Marcy G's, whose owners, Saul and Marcy Schwedt, have been in business for nearly 40 years. We have a very large evening wear business. Um, we specialize in evening wear for the mother of the bride, the mother of the groom, bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, charity balls. Truth be told, Cherry Hill's Jewish community is one of the few things standing between it and full-on assimilation into generic Gentile America. There's a lot of name chains, restaurants, uh, clothing stores, and uh, other stores that, that have just really taken over Cherry Hill. It's really become a highly commercialized area. But it's lost a lot of that personal flavor that I remember uh, growing up as a child. But that was back in Cherry Hill's old time, Old Testament era. In the beginning, there was farmland, and it was mm, good. It was mostly produce farms and orchards. Uh, many of the farmers who farmed in Cherry Hill at that time uh, owed their livelihoods to Campbell Soup Company in Camden, where they would sell their produce there for soup. And then President Eisenhower said, let there be interstates and FHA mortgages and GI Bill. And lo, there came a great multitude, a veritable exodus from Philly and Camden. They literally came out and started plowing down fields and you know mowing through forests and building suburbs, just one after the other after the other. And the suburbs begat traffic, and traffic begat the mall. It was the first indoor shopping mall on the East Coast, and it brought busloads of shoppers and curious people, consumers, from all over the East Coast. And even the local high school had the prom in the court at the mall in 1962. Yet in the midst of all of this goodness, there was much wickedness, like the Garden State Brace Track. There wasn't anything uh, like it uh, for miles. People would come from all over New Jersey to visit the racetrack. And the Latin Casino. The Latin Casino was a nightclub that sat across Route 70 from the Garden State Racetrack and offered all types of entertainment. Performers nationally, internationally known who played there. Frank Sinatra, the Supremes, Liberace was here. Throughout the 60s, Cherry Hill was not only the land of milk and honey, it was a swinging suburban Sodom and Gomorrah where you could have your cake and your cocktail, too. Pretty soon, other spots followed, including the Hawaiian Cottage, the Rickshaw Inn, Sinelli's, a whole slew of popular night spots and gathering places. But in 1977, it all vanished in one roll of the dice. Literally, that year, casino gambling arrived in Atlantic City. A lot of the entertainment that occurred in Cherry Hill started to play the venues in Atlantic City. And there was no need, really, or interest for people to come to those places anymore. So a lot of the nightclubs that existed in Cherry Hill started to close down. It was the end of an era. But the end of the nightclubs wasn't the end of Cherry Hill. Throughout the 80s, the town grew more and more, and more like everywhere else. What you saw happening were more chains uh, going to Cherry Hill. And Cherry Hill, to a certain extent, began to transform. And, and you lost some of that local flavor. Uh, and it became more a part of uh, really generic America, if you will. By the mid-90s, the Garden State racetrack had closed down and the Latin Casino had been leveled to make room for an office park. Cherry Hill was now just another sprawling swath of middle-income America. Lots of things to do. Lots of movie theaters. Homes are beautiful. Swimming pools. And they keep building. They keep going out farther and farther. Cherry Hill's Sin City heyday was dead and buried. Sin, however, was alive and well, lurking among Cherry Hill's broad lawns and even broader highways even in its largest synagogue. Appearances aside, Cherry Hill didn't miraculously spring from the ground overnight. After all, it's not as if God looked down on his formless patch of South Jersey farmland and commanded 
let there be track housing. Biblically speaking, Cherry Hill is a tale of Abraham a few thousand times over. Family after family from Camden and Philly wandering off in search of their own personal promised land. Uh, many people relocate in Cherry Hill just for the school system. They're family oriented, they're career oriented, they work very hard, uh, they prize education very greatly. They demand the best in their school system. I think they get the best in their school system. And when it came to excellence, few people in Cherry Hill excelled more than Rabbi Fred Newlander. He was a leader that uh, people really looked to him for lots and lots of things and uh, had a lot of answers. He was a bright man. The leader of Makur Shalom, one of Cherry Hill's largest synagogues, the polished and poised rabbi was something of a minor miracle in his own right. Fred had sort of a, a very working class background. He comes from a long line of rabbis. Uh, his family was immigrants. They lived in Albany, New York, uh, literally ran the laundry in town. And he lived upstairs from the laundromat. Even more miraculous was Fred's marriage in 1965 to Carol Lids, whose father was a major player in Manhattan's garment district. Carol grew up in Long Island, you know, with a great big lawn that rolled down to the ocean with a house with a butler and servants. Um, and it, these, these two worlds just sort of met in college and collided, and they, they hit it off. They hit it off on a blind date. And, you know, in a very short period of time after that, they were married. The New Lunders came to Cherry Hill in 1968 when Fred took a job at a local synagogue. The town seemed like the perfect place to start a family, but Fred chafed in his position as assistant rabbi. Being a young rabbi, I believe that he felt that he'd be more um, satisfied by having his own congregation and moving forward consistent with his own values. And in 1974, he did something about it and formed his own congregation, Bakur Shalom. He got together about a dozen couples in a friend's house in the front room one night and just stood up and expounded on what he wanted to do and talked about you know, his vision of what a religious community could be and what a synagogue could be, and, and he felt he was the guy to lead it. And the people right there on the spot put up the money and said, yes, we'll do it. For the first few years, Rabbi Newlander's people wandered, meeting in members' houses and renting hotel conference rooms for major celebrations. But it didn't stay that way for long. It just grew and grew and grew, and family after family heard about it. And he touched a nerve. He really did. People felt very deeply about his way of doing things. He made them feel good about their religion at a time when a lot of people you know, sort of didn't want to be traditional but didn't want to be completely modern. He, he, he really managed to walk that line for people. By 1975, the New Lunders were doing well enough that the family, Fred, Carol, and their three young children, moved into a modest house on Highgate Lane in the Wexford Lees subdivision. It's an area of colonial style homes, properly cared for uh, structures, um, very much, uh, very much typical of Cherry Hill. Not long after, McCour Shalom moved into its first real home, a converted warehouse in an industrial park. It wasn't beautiful on the outside. The inside was a temple, and it was adequate. It was fine for services. While Fred was building his synagogue, Carol was building up a business of her own. She noticed that there was a need for, for restaurants and for people having private parties to have kosher food. I mean, there's, there's a large Jewish population around Cherry Hill, and there's a lot of parties. And Carol just started in her oven at home, making cakes according to kosher recipes, and was very good at it. So good that, by the early 90s, classic cake had grown from the New Lunders kitchen to three shopping center bakeries and four dozen employees. At the same time, McCour Shalom had grown into the largest of Cherry Hill's eight synagogues. In 1991, its 4,000-member congregation moved into fancy new digs, a veritable temple of Solomon. Close to 45,000 square feet, a beautiful structure, and a highly traveled uh, road, uh, accessible from a number of different directions, and uh, one of the largest synagogues in the South Jersey, Philadelphia area. By 1994, the New Lunders were a model of suburban success, which didn't mean their life wasn't without worries. Fred had his king-sized congregation to take care of, and Carol had classic cake, which, come to think of it, was another worry for Rabbi Newlander. After her regular Tuesday night management meeting, 
Carol had gotten in the habit of bringing the day's receipts home with her. Here's a suburban housewife who is coming home from a business at night, packing anywhere from five, 10, 15, 20, 25 thousand dollars sometimes in cash. And she's counting it out on her kitchen table. She's got nothing more than a household front door lock between her and the world. Luckily, Rabbi Newlander had a security expert to turn to for help. A new member of Makur Shalom named Lynn Jenoff. Not only was he private investigator by trade, he supposedly had even more experience dating back to his days with the CIA. The two met in 1992 when Jenoff had fallen on hard times. He had um, recently divorced. He had gone bankrupt, lost his house. His wife and son were living apart from him. He was struggling financially. Besides being down on his luck, Jenoff was also an alcoholic. The result, he explained, of years of stressful undercover work. A non-practicing Jew, Jenoff was referred to the rabbi by a friend at Alcoholics Anonymous. A couple of people at AA knew Fred Newlander and called him and said, would you speak to this guy? Um, because this is part of the deal, and Fred said, sure, I would. And that's how the two of them first got together. And it was the rabbi who helped Jenoff get back on his feet. The rabbi embraced him and said to him that, you know, he was as good as anyone else. And despite the fact that he could not afford to pay the Jews to join the synagogue, the rabbi welcomed him into the synagogue. In fact, the two quickly became friends. Len smoked and the rabbi smoked, and the rabbi wasn't, you know, real proud of that, so they would sort of sneak out the back of the synagogue and stand around out in the parking lot and smoke, you know, kind of out of sight of the kids and everybody else who would be there during the day. And it was during their smoke breaks that Jinoff told the rabbi his spectacular life story. A Vietnam vet, Jinoff had spent years working as an operative for the CIA and NSA. The CIA, uh, the FBI, Iran-Contra affair, this guy did everything, and he had pictures of himself, him with Oliver North, him with Ronald Reagan. Jinnoff's stories sure were impressive. So what if he was Meshuggah, or crazy, as they say? If you were in the CIA, would you tell anybody? I mean, most people, it would seem to me, who'd be in the CIA, wouldn't, would, that's not something you would boast about. But Lenny did, to the point that most friends simply laughed it off. Like the afternoon in Jack Reed's barbershop? I had said something to one of my assistants in Spanish, uh, and he caught that right away, and he, come, he came running up to me and said, uh, do you speak Spanish? I said, somewhat, my, my mother's Cuban. And he said, uh, what do you want to do about Castro? And I said, I could really care less. I was born in Manhattan. You know, I, could really, I don't care. And he said, you know, I tried to kill him three times when I was with the CIA. And I said, sure, and I put my hand in my shirt, and I said, and I'm Napoleon. So why did Lenny Jenoff spend such extravagant tales? Well, which would you rather be? Drunk, divorced, and broke, or secret agent man? He loved attention. That was his whole, his whole mission in life. He always, he wanted to be successful. He wanted to be somebody. He wasn't happy being Lenny. That's why he had to become the ex-CIA agent, or the FBI agent. He wanted to become a hero. He wanted to become uh, somebody very, very important. And thanks to the Rabbi Newlander, Lynn Janoff was about to get his chance. City Confidential will return on A and E. Instead of the split-level oasis of the Ozzy and Harriet era, today's Cherry Hill is a split rear seat world where the moms are more harried than Harriet. Where dinner's in the microwave and go ask your father means calling him on his cell phone. And while the kids were grown, life for Fred and Carol Newlander was no less hectic. On any given day, they spent as much time behind the wheel as they did at home on Highgate Lane. Tuesday, November 1st, 1994 was no exception. After a full day at the synagogue, Fred Newlander picked up a pizza on the drive home. Around six, the rabbi shared it with his son, Matthew, a pre-med student at Rutgers. He was the only one of the three Newlander children still living at home. By 6.30, the rabbi and his son were gone again. 
Matthew to his part-time job as an EMT and the rabbi back to Makur Shalom. Carol wouldn't be home until eight, held up by the weekly management meeting of Classic Cake. He knew his wife would be out working late, and he could stay at the synagogue late and get some extra work done while she was, you know, uh, having her business meetings. And that night, he had arranged to, to be observing the classes, a class of one of his assistant rabbis. He went into choir rehearsal and spoke to a number of members of the choir. While the rabbi was tending to his flock, Carol arrived home at around 8. It was just in time to make her regular phone call to the New London's daughter, Rebecca, in Philadelphia. She was still on the phone at 8.15 when the doorbell rang, which wasn't unexpected. Carol Newlander told her daughter that, that she was not surprised by this because she said, Daddy told me to expect someone to come with a package. Carol even knew the delivery man, sort of. He had been by a week earlier to drop off another envelope and use the New Lunders bathroom. She commented to her daughter, oh, it's the bathroom man again. On the phone, Rebecca was concerned. Carol, however, wasn't. The bathroom man wasn't anyone to be worried about. And he was sort of a comic character. He was a big, bumbling kind of guy, and he just looked disorganized, and she didn't think it was anything sinister. Only it was something sinister about the bathroom man. Carol Newlander just didn't know it. She said goodbye to her daughter and hung up the cordless phone. When Rabbi Fred Newlander headed home a little after nine, Makur Shalom was still bustling with activity. It was 9.20 when he walked through his unlocked front door and straight into hell. It's a white front room which you really have to remember to get the, the full horror of the scenes. White carpet, white walls, you know, white, generally white furnishings, and they are covered in blood. The front room is literally a bloody mess. And right in the center of it was Carol, motionless and white as a sheet. Fred grabbed the cordless phone and immediately called 911. I just came home. My wife is on the floor, and there's blood all over her. It's just a harrowing call. I mean, Fred is, is, is distraught. He's sobbing. He's crying. It's going back and forth. The dispatcher's not clear what's going on. And Fred, during the course of the call, never says what he thinks happened. He just keeps saying, my wife's on the floor. She's covered in blood. I don't know what to do. What should I do? Within seconds, police and ambulance units were converging on the New London house. And riding in one of them, the rabbi realized, was his son, Matthew, the part-time EMT. Fred keeps asking the dispatcher if the dispatcher can prevent Matthew from coming to the house because he doesn't want Matthew to come into the scene and have to pronounce his own mother dead right there in the middle of his own front room floor. Thankfully, by the time Matthew arrived, the house was already crowded with police and paramedics. He approached the house and was told by the police that he couldn't come in any further. It was a crime scene. At that point, he gained the knowledge that his mother had been killed. Moments later, he found his father in the driveway, where he'd been waiting patiently since police arrived. Uh, he seemed very content to remain in the driveway outside and uh, watch as events unfolded. Uh, one of the officers was in the house for a few minutes and came out to make a uh, radio transmission to uh, his superiors. And Rabbi Newlander stood and watched him, made no inquiry about his wife's condition. Inside, it was the condition of the house, not Carol that had investigators puzzled. There wasn't any ransacking. Uh, there wasn't anybody pulling out drawers and, and looking all over the place. It was a perfectly uh, set living room with, unfortunately, a, uh, a murder victim laying on the floor. About the only clue came from the New London's daughter, Rebecca, who'd rushed over from her house in Philadelphia. She told investigators about her phone call with Carol and gave them their first big break in the case the bathroom man. This guy knew that he was at the rabbi's house and that he'd come back and appeared twice because the second call, Carol was able to say, oh, it's the bathroom guy again, and then hung up the phone, and then suddenly an hour later, she's dead. Find the bathroom man, the police figured, and that should solve everything. It sounded simple enough, but when they did find him, well, that's when things got a little complicated. City Confidential will return on A&E.
Nobody thought it could happen here. It's a crime cliche. But on November 2nd, 1994, in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, the old cliche was literally the truth. The New London case was the town's first and only homicide of 1994. We have our share of crimes, such as auto theft and the burglaries at times. It comes and goes. But uh, in, for the most part, the major crimes, such as uh, homicide, uh, is, is not exactly something we have all the time here. It was a kind of random violence Cherry Hill suburbanites had left Philly and Camden to get away from. But was it random? The police weren't so sure. The bathroom man knew Fred was a rabbi. And if he knew that, did he know about classic cake? And more specifically, Carol's habit of taking the day's cash receipts home with her. The detectives questioned employees at Classic Cake, but they got to know closer to uh, flushing out the bathroom man. They questioned everybody from her cake company, past employees, you know, maybe a disgruntled employee, because it, it looked like, like, like a robbery, just a random robbery. Yes, but something about the rabbi's behavior the night of the murder, waiting patiently in the driveway, just didn't seem quite, well, kosher. He was uh, remarkably composed, uh, was not upset, was not crying, was not uh, emotional in any way. So the tone of the 911 call uh, seemed to me to be uh, very much at odds with the uh, demeanor of the man just a few minutes later. Had the rabbi hired the mysterious bathroom man to kill his wife? For the Cherry Hill police, it was a tempting theory. And it fit with the fact that at the time of Carol's death, dozens, maybe even hundreds, of people had seen Fred at McCour Shalom. The rabbi had an airtight alibi, maybe a little too airtight. Can we account for where the rabbi was between 7 and 9 o'clock on that evening? And the answer was absolutely. Absolutely you could account for where he was. And that, was, that in itself became suspicious. Especially when investigators questioned the rabbi's assistance. Fred's movements the night of the murder weren't exactly his usual Tuesday night ritual. The cantor, Anita Hoffman, said that it was very unusual for, for anyone to, to pop into choir practice in the manner in which he did because she did not like interruptions, and the rabbi knew that. So she thought that it was unusual that he came into the room that night. Word of the questioning quickly spread around the synagogue. Coming hard on the heels of Carol's death, doubts about their rabbi were a little hard to take. We believe in Rabbi Newlander's innocence, and we share in the grief of the Newlander family. They were extremely hurt, you know, that uh, the rabbi was the focus of the investigation, and, you know, because this is somebody that they had depended on. This is somebody that uh, when it was involved with their lives. By late February, the press was even speculating that the rabbi had been having an affair. It was enough to make his congregation plots. I just said, there's no way he's involved in this. He just, I just, a man of God doesn't do things like this. That's what they thought, at least. On February 26th, the rabbi admitted that the rumors of adultery were true and submitted a letter of resignation to McCour Shalom. The synagogue was floored. And they had no clue that, that something like this could be going on. I mean, it was inconceivable. I mean, you know, the rabbi's out fooling around with other women. It just doesn't make any sense, especially considering the, the, uh, what appeared to be the obvious happy relationship he'd had for 30 years with Carol. The cops, on the other hand, had all the schmutz on the rabbi's affair. In fact, they'd figured it out weeks earlier, including the name of his mistress, thanks to New Lunder's phone records. There were a lot of calls going one way from Fred Newlander's house to Elaine Sonsini, who's a radio talk show host in downtown Philadelphia, who also lived in Cherry Hill. Wealthy, attractive, and well-known, Sonsini had met Rabbi Newlander when he officiated at her late husband's funeral in 1992. Not long afterwards, the uh, grieving widow joined the congregation of Makur Shalom. She had told us that she had been friends with the rabbi uh, since the death of her husband, and that uh, the rabbi had helped her along through uh, the uh, difficult times after the death of her husband. He was so helpful that Sonsini wanted to make the arrangement permanent. 
She gave the rabbi a choice. End his marriage or their affair. She gave him a deadline. Uh, Ms. Sonsini told Rabbi Newlander that unless something was worked out by the end of the year, 1994, on January the 1st of 1995, she was going to start a new life. In August, the whole torrid story of the rabbi's affair with Sonsini appeared in the local press. Cherry Hill did a double take. I think that you saw a change in how the community felt about Fred Newlander. But I think many people, I think, saw the information, the evidence that came out, and I think that changed their mind. Still, the rabbi had at least one vocal supporter, his old smoking buddy, Lynn Jenoff. He was the rabbi's self-appointed spokesman. If something was going on, uh, you could talk to Len. Len would let you, Len would say, here's how the rabbi feels, here's what the rabbi thinks. He was more annoying than ever. He would be passing out his business cards. Len Jenoff, a private investigator, he would talk to any reporter that would talk to him. He always made himself uh, available to cameras. And besides kibitzing, he was even working with the police to track down the real killer. Still, the case went nowhere, and Lynn Jernoff slowly fell out of the limelight. 1995 gave way to 1996, and then 1997. There was little change in the New Laundry case. Then, on September 10th, 1998, almost four years after Carol's death, Cherry Hill police arrested Rabbi Fred Doodlander. And on January 11, 1999, when the grand jury indicted the rabbi on solicitation of murder, Len Janoff, Doodlander's best friend, was nowhere in sight. On the morning of May 1st, 2000, came the big break in the case. Cherry Hill awoke to the startling news that the mysterious bathroom man was finally in police custody. And his name, it turned out, was none other than Len Janoff. The newsroom, which is rarely shocked, was dramatically surprised to, to realize that everyone had been looking around South Jersey for years saying, who killed her? And to realize that it was Len Janoff, uh, a guy that we had dealt with. So it's, it's a very big surprise. Jenoff had confessed to the crime nearly two years ago, but not to the cops. Instead, he told his story to Philadelphia Inquirer reporter Nancy Phillips. He insisted that at the time, he did not know that Carol Newlander was the intended victim. He said that the rabbi told him that there was someone who was an enemy of Israel who needed to be killed and that the murder could be justified because it was for a good cause. The way Jenoff explained it, the rabbi offered to use his connections to get Jenoff into the Mossad, the Israeli secret service. He also paid Jenoff $30,000 for the hit, much of it disguised as payment for Jenoff's services as a security consultant. In April of 2000, Phillips convinced Jenoff to go to the cops. Lynn laid out the whole story about how he was a bathroom man and how he had convinced a friend from AA, Paul Michael Daniels, to help him beat Carol Newlander to death. Suddenly, the prosecution not only had the actual killer, but a star witness to the whole conspiracy, all rolled into one nice, not-so-neat package. Unfortunately for them, that package was Len Jenoff. Len Jenoff is really a complete flake. I mean, that's what it boils down to. Len Jenoff is just a preposterous person. Everything about Len Jenoff, when you start pulling his records and looking at his resumes and looking at his history, is a lie. I mean, starting right from college. He graduated from Monmouth College. Actually, he didn't graduate from Monmouth College. He served in the Army in Vietnam. Actually, he was a cook in the reserves and never left the United States. You know, he was down with the CIA working with Oliver North in Iran-Contra. Actually, he's never been any closer to Nicaragua than Puerto Vallarta on vacation once. I mean, nothing Len Janoff has said about his background is true. Which was the prosecution's biggest problem when the rabbi's trial began on October 15th. This is the matter of State of New Jersey versus Fred Newlander. Elaine Sonsini's testimony was certainly enough to convince the jury that the rabbi was having an affair. 
In fact, the rabbi didn't even deny it. Murder, however, was way more complicated. For a conviction, the prosecutors had to convince the jury that, in exchange for a job with Israel's secret service, Jedoff agreed to kill an enemy of Israel. That just happened to be the Rabbi Newlander's wife. The defense, however, had a different and far less fantastic theory. Sure, Jedoff was a bathroom man, but it wasn't the promise of a job with the Mossad that brought Jedoff to the Newlander's doorstep. It was robbery. They had conversations with Rabbi Newlander about security systems at the synagogue and a security system at his home and would have been well aware of the fact that Fred Newlander had a concern about his wife bringing home large sums of money. And all the stuff about Mossad and enemies of Israel, according to the defense, they were simply figments of Jenoff's overactive imagination. Rabbi Newlander had no connection with the Mossad. The only thing he did for Jenoff was give him the phone number of the Israeli consulate. That's it. When Fred Newlander took the stand on October 30th, the rabbi turned the witness stand into a bully pulpit to profess his innocence. Unfortunately for him, he'd given better sermons. How did you feel about the prospect of, of terminating the relationship that you had with her? Well, obviously there was, um, you know, there was some, uh, there was some feelings between us. Um... He came what, some across somewhat arrogant narcissistic, uh, somebody who believed that by the force of his personality that he could sway a jury. And during cross-examination, things got even worse. I really can't say. I don't, I don't recall. I can't remember. I don't know how much it was. He goes under cross-examination, and all of a sudden, he mutates into this lying, adulterous, hypocritical guy who can't remember anything. You just saw his facade crumble, and you had to—you were left wondering how low could he go? Low enough to arrange his wife's murder? That all depended on who the jury believed. The adulterous Rabbi Newlander or pathological liar, Len Jenoff. City Confidential will return on a and &E. On November 1st, 2001, the jury retired to consider the verdict in the case against Rabbi Fred Newlander. It was seven years to the day since Carol Newlander's murder, which was way too long as far as Cherry Hill was concerned. I wanted it to end. I wanted it closure for the children, the community, for myself, my wife, just so we knew what was going on. You know, it, it was way too long. It was overdue. Only the wait was far from over. After almost two weeks of deliberation, the jury finally filed back into the Camden County Courthouse, not to announce a verdict, but to announce they couldn't reach one. I am going to declare a mistrial, and I do hereby declare a mistrial. The jury, I find, is at a complete standstill. You are deadlocked, and no further amount of time could ever be productive. To believe that the murder went down the way the prosecution said it went down, you have to believe Len Genoff. And any other day of the week, under any other circumstance, Len Genoff is the last person you would believe. Fred Newlander was relieved. But a hung jury wasn't absolution. And right from the get-go, the prosecutors were determined to give it another try. And the next morning, I awoke, and I saw the front cover of the Philadelphia Inquirer and a large picture of Fred Newlander smiling jovially. So once I saw that picture, uh, that portrayed to me a man who thought he had beaten the system and a man who thought he'd continue to beat the system. So at that point, I was ready to pick the jury again that same afternoon and, and start the case again. When his second trial got underway in October of 2002, Newlander's son Matthew and daughter Rebecca Newlander did testify, but for the prosecution. He wasn't breathing heavily, wasn't crying or showing any outward sign of grief or remorse at all. Rebecca and Matthew, they had seen the first trial. I believe that had changed their view of the rabbi, that had changed their view of the whole case. Even if you don't believe Jenoff, um, certainly these kids are credible. 
and they don't want to believe that their father might have done this, um, but they were simply just telling the truth. And that apparently changed everything. What is the unanimous verdict of the jury? Not guilty or guilty? Guilty. The case that had divided Cherry Hill for nearly a decade was almost over. All that was left was the sentencing, and everyone wondered what the rabbi would say now that he'd been found guilty. Surprisingly, he was as arrogant as ever. Thou shalt not follow the multitude to pursue evil. I know what no one else in this room knows. I and I alone know that I am innocent. Everyone else who has spoken, everyone else who has uh, provided written material, believes that I am guilty. Or more insidiously, needs to believe that I am guilty. Simply floored, uh, I think everybody watching, he didn't acknowledge what had happened. Uh, he didn't act in any way like a contrite or chastened human being. He acted like he was giving a sermon, like he was picking up from where things had been left off back when he was in charge of McCoy Shalom. But this time, Fred wasn't the only one who got to give a sermon. Speaking before the court, Carol's brother Edward let Fred know exactly what he thought. During the ensuing eight years, you acted in a manner so repulsive the words cannot begin to describe the type of person that you became. You are a murderer. You are a liar, a coward, a cheat. You dishonored Carol, yourself, your children, this court, your congregation, the rabbinate, and Judaism. It's doubtful that Fred Newlander, now serving a life sentence, would ever again set foot in the synagogue he'd built from nothing. And Lynn Janoff, Carol Newlander's confessed killer, appears as remorseless as the rabbi. Never once said he was sorry to kill Mrs. Newlander. He was only concerned about the Booker movie deal. Uh, his lawyer had Stone Phillips come up to see him in the county jail. Along with his accomplice, Paul Daniels, Janoff is serving a 23-year sentence for killing Carol Newlander. So for the time being, the prison library is as close as Jinoff gets to any book deals. Who knows, maybe one day he'll check out the secret life of Walter Mitty. In his mind, he can't be a hero on the streets. He might as well be a hero in jail. Because you know, he thinks he's just going through a CIA operation where he's, uh, he's being incarcerated for it. While Jenoff and the rabbi sit in prison, Cherry Hill goes on much as always. The mall is just as busy, the traffic on Route 70 just as bad, and McCoy Shalom remains, in spite of everything, one of the largest and fastest growing of Cherry Hill's many synagogues. Amazingly enough, what, what, what Fred created is, is stronger and more durable than Fred himself. It will be a lasting legacy for Fred Newlander, regardless of what happens for, for decades to come. Maybe. If you go to their website today, you'll find no mention of Rabbi Fred Newlander. Uh, they have a history. Uh, they have a variety of uh, different things about McCor Shalom. His name doesn't appear. Uh, the only place where you'll find the Newlander name is on a listing for memorial contributions uh, in memory of Carol Newlander. What little remains of Cherry Hill's past is vanishing, too. The Garden State racetrack is scheduled to come down soon. In its place, developers are planning a newfangled town center that has more in common with Camden or Philly than it does Cherry Hill. It'll have recreational amenities, it'll have housing, it'll have commercial, um, a little bit of everything. It's gonna, Cherry Hill's trying to develop into the downtown it, it never had. Unfortunately, the New Lunder family will not be part of the new Cherry Hill. Carol has been gone for almost a decade. Her children have moved away, and Fred will not be eligible for parole until after his 90th birthday. Dedicated cops. We never got a lead that we considered hot. Examine clues. Follow leads. Play hunches. My heart told me she had something to do with it. Sometimes justice is personal. We will be handling this as a homicide. The series that inspired a...